Hi, this is Stuart Weems and welcome to the Investopoly podcast. My goal is to give you simple, easy to understand strategies, insights and tips to help you master the game of building wealth. And in this episode, I'd like to ask you whether investment returns are important or not. Uh, You see, last week, a prospective client, um, who actually is now subsequently a new client, asked me a very good question. Uh, They asked me whether I had any data that shows what investment returns I've generated on behalf of my clients. And whilst this sounds like a very logical question, um, my response was that not only did I not have this data, which I'll come back to, um, but also it wouldn't necessarily be that useful. Because uh, the reason is that investment returns are highly dependent on a client's, uh, you know, many factors like a client's stage of life, their risk profile or appetite, you know, how much investable cash flow they have, um, their starting financial position. And there's many, many factors that will determine what the plan is, what the asset allocation is, how aggressively we're investing, whether there's any borrowings involved and so forth. So unless those factors are identical to that prospective client, it really doesn't tell them very much about expected returns. Now, just a a little sidebar on why I don't have that data. Well, it it would be incredibly easy to generate uh, if all investments were on an investment platform, uh, which a lot of our investments are, for example, super. So I can certainly pull out all our super returns over certain periods across our client base. Um, But of course, clients have other assets like, in particular, direct property. So unless you're going to go out and and value every single client's property uh, independently at a particular uh, point in time in in the end of financial year, end of calendar year or something like that, uh, it's going to be very difficult to work out you know, what, what overall return you've generated for that particular client. And even if they have other assets, you know, unlisted assets, those sorts of things, it can be inherent, inherently difficult. So whilst I've thought about uh, a number of times, it would be good to sit down and work out what is uh, the overall return I've been generating for clients. Uh, it, it's not an easy task. Uh, it's a very timely and costly task if you're going to do it. Uh, and really the the basis of this podcast or the theme of this podcast is is it going to provide us any meaningful information? So the first uh, observation or, or thought, certainly when I was asked the question, was that uh, well, really does returns tell us the full story? And it doesn't. So you know, if I told you that we generated 100% return for our clients over the last 12 months, of course you'd probably be impressed. Uh, and most people aren't going to say, no, I don't want 100% return. But really it tells me nothing about two things. Firstly, the risk that I took to generate that return. High returns are almost impossible to achieve without taking high risk. Now, high risk isn't appropriate uh, for a lot of people. Secondly, uh, whether those returns are sustainable, and I don't think anyone's going to be surprised if I argued that 100% per annum returns are just not sustainable. It's not going to uh, go on forever. But we have to realize that the laws of compounding capital growth tell us we're much better off if we just earn a sort of basic or average return uh, each year for the next 30 years than try and shoot for the fences uh, and generate 100% in one year, but then losses in other years and so forth. So you're, you're better off to have a nice, smooth, predictable return than significant volatility over time. The other ob- important observational comment I have is that um, uh, longer term returns are important, yes, but short term returns aren't necessarily uh, that important to measure, or not necessarily measure, but you can't necessarily expect to be better off in the short run uh, when you start investing. And I've got a couple of examples where that might occur in our client base. For So the first one, and probably a really common one, is if I go and advise a client to invest in property, Uh, Will I enjoy a a lot of capital growth over the first 12 months of owning that property? Well, maybe, maybe not. Maybe the property is worth exactly the same in 12 months' time. But the entry costs are significant. You know, you have to pay for stamp duty, maybe buyer's agents' fees, legal fees, et cetera, et cetera. So in that first year, it's quite possible you could be worse off. So what's the return? The return is negative. Does that mean it's bad advice or a bad strategy? Of course not. If it's a great property... It's going to generate significant wealth over the next 30 years. But that shorter term return doesn't necessarily reflect that. 
A second example was um, leading up to uh, COVID, so during, say, 2018 and 19. Uh, we were actively reducing the amount of exposure our clients had to the US tech sector, uh, mainly because we were were mostly concerned about the valuations and the sustainable the sustainability of those valuations, and therefore what future returns we might receive. Now, when COVID hit, we know what happened. All those technology companies did incredibly well. You know, work from home was a new fad, and all of a sudden, let's invest in technology. And so by having a lower exposure to that sector, um, we underperform the broader market. Um, but what's happened since then, particularly in calendar, this calendar year 2021, is those tech companies, a lot of them, that didn't have sustainable profits and cash flows and so forth, um, have lost a lot of ground. And uh, we have then more, more than made up for any returns that we missed out during 2020, we've more than made up for them in 2021. So... It's possible when when you construct a portfolio that in the short term, uh, your shorter terms might suffer in the pursuit of maximising longer term returns. And that's not only acceptable, but often unavoidable and necessary. The reality is, as a financial advisor, is I cannot control returns. I can, can, cannot control what markets will do in the short run. And in fact, no one in the world has control of that, over that. Uh, and and uh, in the short term, markets can be irrational, unpredictable, highly volatile. They can be all those things. And we have to realise or come to terms with the fact that no one in the world, Nobel laureates or otherwise, have developed a model that can reliably and consistently predict what assets will do in the short term. The reality is no one has any control and no one really knows. However, the factors I can control on behalf of my clients, there's many of those factors, including the investment fees that we pay, the methodology that we employ, you know, whether it's robust, tested, evidence-based, the investment strategy, long-term strategy that we formulate for clients, the asset allocation that we adopt, the quality of the underlying investments, all those things I can control, but I cannot control the ultimate returns. In the long run, we know that all those factors, all those decisions uh, greatly contribute towards the return. So in the long run, returns are, are arguably more predictable. Let me explain this or illustrate this with a, a short analogy. Think about a personal trainer. A personal trainer doesn't have any control over the amount of weight her client might lose in the short run. Um, but the personal can, trainer can control you know, how much her client exercises, the meal plan that her client follows and other in sort of environmental factors. The weight her client loses is merely a consequence of these behaviours. And we know that, or most of us know that, um, if her client consistently follows a a strong exercising program, a disciplined meal plan, etc., etc., for many months or even years, the results become uh, far more predictable. That is, they're going to lose weight, they're going to be healthier, etc., etc. Well, the same is true when it comes to financial advice. I don't know what returns will do. I don't know what markets will do. But I know that if we follow a disciplined, fundamentally sound approach, that in the long run, it's going to work out really well. In the short run, no one really knows. So this topic made me think about a a study that's done every year by a global investment manager called Russell Investments. Um, And so their most recent study in 2021 looked at what, how valuable is financial advice and what are the components of that? And they look to calculate, and I've got the link in the show notes and the blog on the website to the full report. But the aim of the report was to really assess and, and quantify, you know, what is the total value of ad- advice and what are the components that are contributing towards that overall value? So um, uh, the first thing I will say is we need to be mindful that firstly, um, the value for everyone's going to be different. Um, And, of course, in the report, there's certain assumptions and those assumptions might not necessarily relate uh, perfectly to your situation. And then secondly, the sceptic in me uh, reminds me that, hey, this is a report prepared by a fund manager for its clients. Its clients are financial advisors. And what they're trying to do here is help financial advisors justify their value. So there's a lack of a bit of independence there. And um, so, you know, we, we can't read too much into the report. But having said that, the overall theme, I think I agree with. Uh, anyway, 
The answer is they reckon uh, quality financial advice contributes 4.83% per annum to your investments every year. So that's the value, almost 5%. Um, uh, that's the value of advice. Um, interestingly, the investment part of the services that an advisor provides um, only contributed a small amount, less than 16% of that overall value. So there's two tasks or things that an advisor does um, which they attribute or they've attributed uh, this value to. So the first one is asset allocation, which is really in the report they've called it product alignment. Um, but this is really the, you know, how where to invest your money, how much to put in property, how much to put in Australian shares, international shares, et cetera, et cetera. That's the asset allocation thing. And the second uh, task is active rebalancing. So that's sort of changing that asset allocation over time, uh, depending on how markets perform. Anyway, that that sort of investment side, um, which I think is a, a really important side, and, and probably a lot of people think that's all financial advisors do. Well, according to Russell, uh, they think that only contributes 0.79, so uh, less than 1%, almost 0.8 of 1%. Uh, towards your investments. Uh, so they're saying of the, which is only you know, 0.79 of a total value of 4.83, it's only about 16%. So this report is acknowledging really it's not really just about investments. There's a whole lot of other factors that uh, an advisor can help with. So there was three other main factors that the most valuable was um, behavioral coaching. Uh, they reckon that added uh, 2.02. And again, you can see in the report how they've come up with these figures. Um, I describe behavioural coaching as stopping my clients from making costly mistakes. And a mistake can include not following fundamentally sound advice. So, you know, someone's here to help you, to steer you in the right direction, let them do that. Um, and this can be, I think, incredibly valuable. Uh, the second one comes from tax structuring uh, in terms of saving tax on investments. They reckon that contributes 1.2%, um, and I think that would be easily the case. It can include things like using different ownership structures like a family trust. Different investment products will have you know different um, return distributions and allocations and so forth. And even super strategies, you know, there's a lot you can do with super um, to minimise tax on investments. So... Uh, they reckon that adds 1.2%. And the last one was having a strategic plan. And they reckon that added 082 of a percent. Um, and, that, and that plus the investment advice was the total value. So the strategic plan, mainly it provides a context, a context for making financial decisions. So if I have a strategic plan and I'm contemplating X or Y, you know, buying a, a holiday house or changing my employment and therefore it has an impact on my income. If I'm contemplating making those decisions and I don't have a plan, I don't know how it's going to impact me. But if I have a plan, a, a well-defined strategic financial plan, then I can measure, will this add to the plan or detract from the plan and, is, and therefore is it a good idea or not? So it's really interesting to see that this report's really saying that it's the non-investment related matters where the most value uh, lives in in regards to uh, financial advice. And on a general theme, I agree with that, although I think the investment-related matters are still very important. For example, if I, uh, I've seen some terrible advisors put clients in terrible investments that have not performed and lost a lot of money and, and or missed a lot of opportunity cost. And so you, you'd be hard-pressed to argue that that's there's no there's not a lot of value in in making sure the actually investment uh, part is right. Look, I appreciate that choosing a financial advisor is probably an inherently difficult task because how do you really judge the value of advice when you don't even know what the advice is going to be? You know, until a financial planner actually develops a plan, even they can't speak to you know what the outcomes might possibly be. Uh, so as I've said in the past, you know, you should absolutely focus on factors like independence, experience, credibility, uh, their philosophy that they um, uh, employ and whether it's evidence-based and so forth. A lot of those things go a long way to um, uh, assuring you whether that advisor is the right, uh, the right firm and the right person or not. Um, now, of course, it's tempting to ask about 
investment returns, but I really don't think that provides a lot of insight. Of course, if you're choosing a stockbroker and all they're doing is investing a certain uh, element of your portfolio, then that's a very valid question. But if it's holistic advice, then returns, historic returns don't necessarily uh, tell you the full picture. Perhaps uh, a better question would be, you know, what is the longevity of your relationship? So how many clients do you lose to other advisors? You know, how many clients uh, do they have that, that decide that uh, they don't want to deal with you anymore and they pick another advisor to move to? Because I think if that is low or zero, then it gives you a sense that um, that their clients uh, feel like they're getting value. And secondly, that their clients are, are happily advancing towards their goals because you're not going to hang around with an advisor if you don't think you're getting value and if you're not moving ahead, are you? So I think that probably provides better insight than what the returns question might uh, might do. Anyway, that wraps up my riff for about investment returns and how important they are in the context of our overall plan. At the end of the day, as a financial advisor, my main goal is to help my clients achieve their goals. And uh, it's, it's a very sort of goal-orientated uh, outcome approach. Um, and I think at the end of the day, we all want to just enjoy a really comfortable retirement, have choice about uh, at some stage of life how much we want to work or not. Um, and not need to worry about money. And if I think we can deliver on all those things, uh, then I think most of my clients are going to be pretty pleased. Okay, that's it for me for this week. Until next week, bye for now.